May 2006 was the 50th anniversary of one of the most legendary dates in the modern British theatre calendar, the premiere of John Osborne's Look Back in Anger. It was rightly a moment for its theatre, the Royal Court, to celebrate that play's legacy and the building's half-century championing hundreds of new playwrights and thousands of new plays that have gone on to be performed all over the world. 50 years after Jimmy Porter first barged his way into the British cultural imagination, the same stage was occupied by a different play. This was Motortown by Simon Stevens. In many ways, it was very different. Uh, it had, particularly in Raman Gray's um, playful, stripped back production, a European aesthetic that would not have been to Osborne's taste. Uh, it had a degree of directness of um, language and violence that would never have got past the theatre censor who was still operating in the 1950s. But like Look Back in Anger, it was a play of confrontation, uh, an accusation at the failures of Britain and British culture and the British. It had an anti-hero who was arrestingly articulate, um, shockingly cruel, magnetically horrible, horribly magnetic. Uh, and that Stephen's play was chosen to occupy the Royal Court's main stage, perhaps the most important stage for new plays in the world, on that auspicious anniversary, felt like a torch was being passed. It was an acknowledgement, I thought, that his was a generational voice as compelling, as sharp, as eloquent as, Osborne, uh, as Osborne's had been half a century before. I, I doubt anyone would dispute that Simon Stevens has been one of the most influential playwrights to emerge uh, in the first two decades of the 21st century. He is uh, extraordinarily, generously prolific. I keep a pretty close eye on his work, but I can't keep up with his output. I'd estimate that he's had around 45 plays on in the last 20 years. That's an average of more than two new plays a year. Uh, many of his plays have been performed abroad and haven't been seen in Britain. And that means we've had the privilege of watching his development up close and we've had a chance to kind of identify his particular styles and their divergences. There's an incredible range. He's written a small scale experimental collaboration with a choreographer, Nuclear War, in 2017, I think. And he also wrote the multi-Olivier winning, Tony Award winning, world bestriding behemoth that is uh, uh, the Curious Case incident of the Dog in the Night time, which is itself, in fact, a very experimental play. There's a great range to his work. He's written some kind of naturalistic plays, Herons and Poor early on in his career, Harper Regan, Punk Rock, Blindsided, uh, they're all sort of naturalistic, but I hesitate to say that without qualification because um, while these plays are set in recognisable locations among fairly ordinary people and nothing exactly supernatural happens, there are aspects of the plays that push at the edge of transparent lifelikeness. Um, one is the ferocious articulacy of Stephen's characters. Typically, his plays will include characters who are insistently, almost manically articulate, determined to express their sudden perception of the world and its wonders. And this, second, has a tendency, for me anyway, to displace and complicate a clear sense of their 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 psychological transparency. They're sometimes so transparent, if this makes sense, they start to seem opaque. Good examples of this would include the characters in Wastwater 2011, who <clears throat> talk and talk, but one senses do so because there's a void within them gnawing away. Stephen's characters are psychologically rich, but also on some level, I think, mysterious. 
this hyper eloquence has been very very influential in 21st century British writing it's kind of I think washed away for quite a lot of writers the clipped subtext of of Harold Pinter in favor of a kind of improvisatory abundance the third thing that I think complicates his plays is there's a sense of personal and social alienation and brokenness in the plays these are stories um, that are studded with sudden, inexplicable, extreme violence, um, cruel, deliberate exploitation, um, pornographic nihilism. But at the same time, against that, there are also always, always moments of redemptive tenderness, vulnerable humanity, love and trust in the darkness. A second strand of Stephen's work, which has been really influential, has been his engagement with Europe. Uh, that way was prepared by a previous generation, Sarah Kay, Mark Ravenhill, Martin Crimp, but Simon has engaged more directly with European directing traditions. Um, I would say that 25 years ago, European auteur directors were often uh, figures of fun in the British theatres and, and they're kind of caricatured as people who would impose some outlandish and irrelevant directorial signature all over the play, kind of graffitiing it, drawing all attention from the play to the director. People don't really talk like that anymore. And Simon Stevens is one of the reasons. Um, from his first delighted encounter with Sebastian Newbling's direction of his work, he's developed genuine collaboration. Um, Simon has started to strip away the naturalistic um, clutter in his play texts to lay down some of his dramaturgical weapons, creating texts that are much more um, open, that try not, not to resist or constrain the nature of the collaboration. Um, Pornography, one of his major plays, 2007, comprises seven scenes with virtually no stage directions that can be performed in any order. Three Kingdoms was a sprawling, globe-trotting crime thriller whose investigation gets murkier and murkier, creating a theatre text that seems to designed uh, to kind of fall apart rapturously in performance. Um, when the production, which toured Europe in 2012, came to the Lyric Hammersmith in London, it was, for many of us, one of the defining moments in 21st century British theatre, a moment where something absolutely changed. Um, he's engaged enthusiastically with European directors, including Eva van Hover, uh, Katie Mitchell, I think sort of counts as a European director, and uh, the late Patrice Chéreau. Uh, and he's been instrumental in encouraging British directors like um, Carrie Cracknell, like Sean Holmes, like Michael Longhurst, to explore uh, the more European sensibilities in their work. Uh, he's engaged with European canon. He's offered English versions of plays by Jan Fosse, Odin van Horvat, uh, Henrik Ibsen, Anton Chekhov, Bertolt Brecht, and so on. Motortown is kind of a response, a rewriting of Buchner's Wojciech, and Carmen Disruption is a kind of response, rewriting of Bizet's opera Carmen. Um, and in doing all of this, he's kind of changed what a playwright is. Uh, the 21st century has continually reinvented what a playtext might look like, the relationship it might have to production, the kinds of collaboration it makes possible, the kinds of stories it allows us to tell. And Simon Stevens is one of the key figures in making that change. He's also in person an energetic, generous, constantly thinking, constantly wondering presence. We're going to focus a, a, a little bit on, on this play, uh, Light Falls, which ran at the Royal Exchange last year. It's a beautiful play, and I hope it has a, a further life. Um, the connection wasn't great, so you'll see there are a few more edits as, as uh, than normal, because so I've, I've tried to remove the the most egregious glitches but to be honest I'd have had to edit it down anyway because Simon and I chatted for almost two hours and and frankly people have got homes to go to so uh, there's much to relish and enjoy in what Simon says about writing and his own writing and I'm very pleased 
to introduce to you Simon Stevens. Yes. Hello. <laughs> How are oh, you? Look at the cacophony of books behind the pair of us. <laughs> no, look at that. <laughs> Man, is this your library? This is, this is my this is my office. This is where I work. This oh, where, yeah, this is where I, I should. Work. What I do need to say though is that this uh, these are my books, but they're not actually behind me. They are over there, but I've got a really banal actually behind me as a mantelpiece. You could kind of see if I move around, my fingers sort of disappear and things like that. But uh, yeah, they're over there, which is a bit weird. But I wanted it to look a bit more scholarly. That's quite good. Rightly. <laughs> How is okay. lockdown for you? Um, well, I mean, uh, like like a lot of people I've been speaking to recently, I'm very, uh, I'm really, really, really lucky, really lucky. Um, so uh, my lockdown experience has been really peaceful, and because we've got, I've got the kids back got oscars back from university um uh and so there's five of us and we've got the dog and oscar figured out recently that uh figured out last week that if you include the dog as one of us that for each of us can experience potentially 62 different combinations of people in the household so it kind of never gets boring it's quite it's quite, it's quite good um and then and then because i'm not because i'm healthy which is the main thing and all the people I love are healthy, yeah. um, you know, which is really fortunate. Um, it's not. It's not been traumatic. I worry about the industry a little bit, but that kind of feels as though that's going to be. That feels like it's a worry that I've been fortunate in terms of not having had shows cancelled. Right, I was going to say, which is really fortunate. So. Um... Can I ask you about where your plays start? Do they typically start in a similar way, i.e. with, you usually start with an image or a character or an issue, or do they start from lots of different places? Um, I, I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to kind of generalise to a degree because I realise I've written quite a lot now. <laughs> just a load. Um, so I'm kind of um, nervous about giving too um, confident an answer. Oddly, I think for me, something which I've always clung on to in my working life, um, the, the plays start normally with a theatre, and they normally start with a theatre in a, uh, an architectural sense, in a visual sense and also a kind of cultural sense. So theatres not only have different aesthetics and different kind of structural aesthetics that excite me as an artist. I like imagining writing plays for different stages um, uh, or different kind of environments. Um, but also clearly all theatres have their own cultural context and the notion of writing a play for one theatre has a meaning for me that really excites me. Um, and also they, the the people running the theatres, I'm engaged in conversation with them. So for me, um, the play is a product of a kind of series of conversations, some of which are with artistic directors or literary managers or directors, and some of which are um, kind of more, more private conversations that I have with audiences, where I'll be like, I want to put this play in front of you lot. I, want, I wonder what you would think of this idea. Uh, and, and I've always been excited by that conversational element to, to playwriting. And so would that mean that when you're writing a play, you, you're imagining um, actors saying these lines on a stage rather than, yeah. say, real people in a real pub somewhere talking? Yeah, always. Yeah, always. always. Yeah. I mean, I say always. I'm, now I'm going back. Was it the same with that? But pretty much, yeah, pretty much always. Uh, and, it, and, it's, and, it, and it's often for me um, specific actors that sometimes I'm able to cast and sometimes I'm not able to cast. Sometimes I know them well and sometimes I've never met them before and I'm just writing because I like them or I'm inspired by them or provoked or stimulated in some way. Um, uh, and it's often particular, and it's, and, it's, 
and it's often uh, particular directors as well, increasingly particular directors. Mm. Um, you know, and uh, the most one of the most recent plays that I wrote, uh, I wrote with a designer in mind. That was the first time that had happened. And, but I suppose, if, let's say, once you've got a particular theatre and you're, you know you're writing under commission for that particular theatre, um, do you already have an idea when you accept the commission or, or not? I think more often than not, I don't. More often than not, more often than not, the commission will percolate for some time before it's crystallised into idea. Right. I think, I think that's right. I think that's right. I'm kind of checking with myself. To, yeah, I, th I think it is right. And I think um, uh, the kind of like, the, the, the kind of stew of ideas that kind of goes through your head every day. If I know that there's a commission there, it might be the, one of the kind of ingredients from that stew which well, just fits really perfectly in a certain theatre and that'll be where the starting point of an idea comes from. Right. The, um, I think, I think that's right. <laughs> it's really, it's, it's, it's really hard to talk after the fact mm. because the process can be quite a complicated one um, and quite an uncertain one as well. And uh, it can be a process of, um, of unconscious exploration of things as much as anything else. Yep. Uh, and, and memory is so unreliable as well. Like our memories are just unbelievably unreliable. Yeah. Well, I mean, resources. So, thinking about uh, this play. Uh, oh yeah. Do you kind of remember anything early on where you kind of thought, "Ah, oh, hold on, I think I'm beginning to get an idea for a play here." What I what I what I had, um, and I think, on this particular example, I had the commission before I'd had uh, the experience. Was I had a feeling or an impulse or something I wanted to investigate. Hmm. I remember specifically um, being in London and talking to a friend on the phone who was in Manchester. Uh, and the and it was a beautiful sunny day in London around about 2015, 2014, 2015. And uh, it was it, it was you know in the days when we were able to leave our houses and go out into kind of bars and restaurants and things like that. And it was a, I was sitting in a quite a nice cafe, just chatting to my friend in Manchester. Uh, and Manchester's a city in pretty good nick, in pretty good health. But I, in the throes of the conversation, I remember being startled by the elegance of the cafe around me as we were talking about the era of austerity in the time of austerity. And I thought I was living in a part of London which didn't experience austerity in the way that most of the country did. And I wanted to go and explore that in my emotional state. So I had the idea of going on a road trip across the north of England. And this is the idea that I present, and this is the feeling that I had that I presented in a process to Sarah Franken. I had the idea that we would go together, and we did three fifths of it together, to five places in the north of England that had defined my sense of self, but to which I'd never been. Um, which sounds paradoxical, but I'll explain it. I'd never been to the Blackpool Winter Gardens but that was where my grandparents met. So me and Sarah went to Blackpool. Uh, I'd never been to Ulverston in the Lake District, but that was where my mum was raised by my grandma when my grandfather was in the war, so effectively raised as a single parent. I'd never been to Warrington where my dad worked, so we went to Warrington, uh, or to Doncaster where my dad uh, drank quite heavily in the years before he died. Uh, and then I've never been to Durham for my family to go to university. So um, 
I presented to Sarah the idea of going on this road trip together. Uh, and together we went across the north of England. Uh, we went to Blackpool. Uh, and in each of, each of the places that we went to, we met the equivalent of uh, a contemporary equivalent of those figures from my biographical hinterland. So in Blackpool, where my grandparents had met, we met a young couple who just got together uh, and were starting a family. In Ulverston, where my mum was raised, I met women from a single parents charity and talked to them about the experience of being a single mother in Ulverston in 2017, I guess. Uh, in Warrington, I met a couple of businessmen, like my dad was a businessman, the contemporary equivalent of my dad. Uh, and in Doncaster, uh, we spoke to people from an alcoholics charity who were dealing with alcoholism um, and talked to them about their lives. And then in Durham, we met the law students of the, law, of the Durham Law Department. And I built up a notebook of research. So the story of the play went from feeling to process of exploration and investigation and then just this building up this notebook of research and it's about that time i think it was the people that i met i think it was meeting the couple in blackpool it was meeting the women in olverston and the people in doncaster the businessmen in warrington and the law students in durham <clears throat> there was something you know if there's an epiphany moment i think i think for me epiphany is I always use the metaphor of resonant frequencies. You know how some material, all materials have a resonant frequency mm. at which they begin to vibrate, yeah? Uh, I think playwrights have resonant frequencies with ideas and there'll be something about an idea where the playwright will just go, oh, 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 there, <laughs> I can feel it. I'm, I'm vibrating a bit. And, um, and I think it was meeting, it was meeting, meeting those people. Uh, and that that really excited me. Uh, what I think is really really interesting to me uh, about that story. Well, one of the things that's very interesting is the way that you constructed for yourself a kind of external structure that was kind of somewhat outside your control, in the sense that you have these five towns these five places mm. and you're going yeah. to kind of write in response to those and I think of the way that actually the way you've done you've written quite a few plays like Carmen Disruption where you go well I'm going to use Carmen and I'm going to yeah. write moment by moment in response to that or even that yeah. that play we've talked about a couple of times that you never actually put on I think where you wrote to the Fibonacci sequence yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. And what I returned to that. I returned to that. I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, like, I've, I've not, um, I've never been asked that question. So I've never had to <clears throat> make my relationship with that knowledge cognitive, you know. So I just need to, th what, what do I think it's about? I think for me, the way I've always thought of creativity, I've always thought of creativity as coming out of a series of tensions. Um, I often talk about, you know, the metaphor I often use when I'm teaching is the metaphor of the muscles in a human body, uh, which are always operate by uh, antagonistic opposition, yeah? So a muscle, you know, my bicep, I will bicep, I will contract my bicep and extend the tricep simultaneously in order to move the arm. You need both muscles to work together. Mm. Uh, and I always talk of um, intellect and instinct as being muscles that operate in antagonistic opposition. Mm. In order to be free, you, in order to be intuitive and instinctive, you need a muscle that can be antagonistic to that that is much more rigorous. And maybe that's what, maybe that's what it is, that I look for structures that I can work against in order to free up the instinct and the intuition. Yeah. I think that's what I want to say now, but I reserve the right to change my mind about that because <laughs> I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> um, can I ask you about the notebook that you mentioned? Yeah. What yeah. kind of, what, 
what kind of things do you put in the notebook? Do I see how... some? Oh yeah, go on then. Yeah, cool, okay. So what have we got here? So this is for a film I'm writing, which is a film adaptation of Tess of the Durbervilles. I like these, uh, I've only done half of it so far because um, I've got work to do. Uh, I hold up to the camera. I like my favorite type of notebook is blank pages. Okay. Because as you'll see, my handwriting is like really, really, really messy. So I quite like, <laughs> I quite like the freedom of being able to scribble. And there'll be some pages which are um, where the text is really tight and some pages where I just write really big letters. And I like that freedom of that. I like to not be restricted. I, what kind of things do I put in them? I have a different notebook for each idea, yeah, for each job. Uh, and they're normally these quite small kind of uh, sketchbooks. And then I've got bigger notebooks, which are more like journals, uh, which aren't places for me to develop specific ideas, but just places for me to exercise my mind in. I've got a couple of those on the go. I normally type them up as well. I normally type the exercises, the, the, all of the journals up just because I can talk about that a little bit. But so, so for a, 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 a notebook on a show that I'm working on, there will be, uh, I always, before I start work, I always have a, a reading list and a film list and uh, another list of kind of th other material that I want to investigate and look at. <clears throat> um, so with Light Falls, for example, I, I had a feeling that I really wanted to read the plays of J.B. Priestley. Um, I kind of realised there was this great, great Mancunian playwright who I didn't really know, so I just wanted to have a look at those. And also, I was interested in time, and he was the master of time in his plays, um, or what you know, one of his brilliant things, uh, one of his areas of interest. Uh, I knew I wanted to read Paul Morley's book, The North, which I'd, it's one of those big books that I'd had on my shelf for years, and I'd never read it, and I thought I'm going to read this. <laughs> Um, I knew that I wanted to look at the films of Terence Davis, um, who, I don't know, do you know Terence Davis? Oh, oh, Terence Davis' yeah. trilogy and Long Day Closes. Beautiful, beautiful filmmaker. Uh, I wanted to, I'd seen them before, but I wanted to look at them again. Um, there were other things that I can't remember that I was looking at. Um, and what I'll do is when I'm reading, I will be making notes while I'm reading, or when I'm watching the movie, I'll be making notes. And it might be, uh, this is a beautiful line of dialogue that I'm going to steal, or this is a gorgeous idea that I want to return to, or <clears throat> or it might be that a line of dialogue or an idea trigger, um, you know, um, fires me to go off in a different direction. I'll write in response to that, and then normally at the end of reading the play or watching the film or reading the book or reading the novel or looking at the art or go or having the conversation like meet going to meet somebody and interviewing them. What I do, what, I, what I've started doing is um, rather than, rather than um, in a not, not a very scholarly way, in a more instinctive way, I'll give myself, say, 15 minutes, 20 minutes to just write everything I can remember about that conversation, <clears throat> which means that I'm present in the conversation. It means there will be good bits which I lose, but there'll be some part of my subconscious that is, per is kind of like selecting for me which bits will remain. Um, and it's a really, it's good because it only takes 10 minutes. <laughs> it's like it's really cheating. You can do, in 10 minutes work, you end up doing, doing a lot of good material. So, or I'll write 10 minutes, everything I can remember from this novel, everything I can remember from the play or from the film. And that will go into the notebook. And, um, and, and, can, and that's, this is really interesting to me, and I'm going to ask a very nuts and bolts kind of question here. Yeah. Uh, uh, the obviously the the notebook is handwritten, but I yeah. think you're saying you type the plays eventually. But also, yeah. with, there's a with a journal. There's a there's a hybrid thing where you're writing them out and then you're typing those up. Does the yeah. difference between handwriting and typing do anything in your yeah. creative life? Yeah, I, re I, I, I don't know what it does. And there's part of me that, you know, in the future when mind mapping is available for everybody, and <laughs> Apple do the kind of neurological mind map, I might, I'll apply it to this. Um, the two types of writing feel very different. And with a notebook for each job as well, uh, I will write, I'll type up the notebook. 
So the test notebook that I'm doing or the Light Falls notebook, I will have gone through and typed it all up, typed up all the intuitive exploratory notes. Um, I think, I think, I've started, th when, I, when I think about making art, when I think about making plays, I, I kind of, I start to think that there are kind of three, three stages of, create, of creation of a play for me at the moment. Um, the, the, and I would describe these as the stage of generation, selection, and articulation, okay? And gen, so the generation is what, you know, they're all self-descriptive, they're not trick words, you know, they're self-descriptive words. Um, that part of making a play, when I just need to exercise my imagination and be free and be expressive and be intuitive and just make stuff, make stuff exist that didn't exist before, I think handwriting that is really freeing. It, it feels more organic. It feels more physical. Uh, and so it feels right to me that when I'm scratching around the kind of for shapes from my head that I handwrite that. And then the typing out the notebook, which seems a bit perverse. And as an academic, when you've done interviews, you, you will know what it's like typing up an interview. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of largely really boring. <laughs> it's kind of like often really, really, really boring. And typing up the notebook is often really boring. Apart from, there'll be some things in it that I don't remember writing. There'll be lines in it that I don't remember writing. There'll be ideas I don't remember having. And the process of, in a very pedestrian way, <coughs> typing them up will put me in a different relationship to the material. I'm no longer generating, I'm selecting. I'm looking at the mess that I've made and just seeing if there's anything that I can use in it. And the process of typing, which is a slower process for me, is really helpful when it comes to selection. And the, uh, and the other thing, which you'll know because we've been friends for 15 years or whatever, and you'll have had emails from me. Anybody who's ever had an email from me will know that I'm a terrible typist. They'll either, think, they'll either think I'm deranged or profoundly dyslexic or, or that I'm a terrible typist. And it's, it's the third, I'm a terrible typist. And normally, I always say I type like how Jerry Lee Lewis plays piano. I kind of I just go, <laughs> you kind of smash it out. So there's, a, there's another stage, which happens in all the plays, where I have to correct the typos. And I, and I used to think this was really boring and I thought, oh, I should get fucking typing lessons. But actually, I think it's brilliant. It's really good because it means I'm just reading very, very slowly. Having gone from writing in a way that's very organic and then reading really, really, really slowly. And then when it comes to writing dialogue, I do think for me, uh, although my typing's bad, it's fast. So I think writing, writing dialogue you know, there's, um, once I've planned a play, once I've shaped it and made and really come up with a plan of it, I, I like writing, I like typing dialogue because I can just type faster. And I think getting that, getting it out from the mind onto the page as quickly as possible is really useful. And that's really interesting, I think, because I think when, with, not with every single play of yours, but with a lot of your plays, I always think when I'm looking at reading the dialogue that there is a real improvisational energy to them. I felt that very much with Light Falls. And I wonder whether, um, I, let me say a, 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 an anecdote, which is Robert Holman. I once saw him talking about how he writes plays. And of course, you've written a play with Robert Holman. But, um, and he said the way he works is he starts writing dialogue at 9.30 in the morning. And it can't be 9.29 or 9.31, he said. Uh, and he says, and I write dialogue until one of the characters says something that surprises me. And uh, of course, I think to anybody who's never written a play, that will sound mental. But of course, I think everybody knows who, if you've written a play, there is that thing where you kind of, you're typing and you go, huh, what a weird thing that person has just said. I wonder what they mean by it. And you, and you carry on. Is that, is that, that, I feel, tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel that is completely central to how the plays actually articulate, in the, to use your word. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely fundamental. And for me, unlike Robert, and you know, 
Um, uh, I adore him as a person and as an artist. He's an extraordinary playwright. Um, we have very different approaches and there's something that we came across and when we wrote A Thousand Stars Explode in the Sky is our approaches are very, are, they have some differences. Um, I don't think, I think that if I just work like he worked, where it's a blank screen or a blank page, and I, I had the characters talking until they said something surprising, I, I think I, maybe I should try it one day, that might be a good idea, but I, I, the reason I don't, or I haven't, is because um, the energy of that, I think would be, there would be a slowness to that that I'd find, uh, I wouldn't find energize my imagination. And what I like, I'm, I'm like, it's really perverse. I really like planning the plays really carefully before I write a word of dialogue. So I know the scene structure. Mm. So by the time I'm writing dialogue, I know how many scenes are in the play, what the fundamental action of each scene is, uh, who's in the scene, where it is, what they want, what's stopping them from getting what they want. Those two big things are really key to me. Who's in the scene, what do they want, what's stopping them from getting what they want. I know how the scene has to end, so I can't, I can't do the thing where uh, I'll be writing a scene and go, oh, it's suddenly about this part of their life that I didn't realise it was about. I'm right. very strict in knowing that my job is to get them from A to B. And I know all the different scenes, I know the job of each scene, and I map that all out before I write anything, any dialogue at all. But knowing that um, if, and also I kind of remember, you know, my working, my working week tends to be very regimented, unlike Robert's, I tend to be very regimented. So I know, for example, if I've got, um, if I've got to deliver a play by the end of April, say, well, partly I'm a real geek, so I'll do another deadline, which is April the 14th, when I will make sure I finish the play. Because I really like really beating the deadlines. I don't like the idea of missing... The idea of missing a deadline would chill me. I'd, I'd re, I'd get, I'd, I'm not in a creative way. I just... I would freeze. I'd be really unhappy. Um, so I, 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 I have the deadline, and then I have the two-week earlier deadline. Um, and then uh, I will work out when I need to write each scene in order to hit that deadline. So I'll know for about the month before what my job of any particular day is. So I'll go into a day and say, right, today's job, I've got to write uh, act two, scene three and four. That's all I need to do today. That, but if I, if I do that, then I'm going to hit my deadline. Everything's been fine. Um, and if I know that and I know what's happening in those two scenes and I know how much time I've got, then I feel completely free. Knowing those restrictions, uh, then I feel really, really like I can go to play. And as long as I get from A to B, then I can go via Z. I can go via letters in the alphabet that haven't been invented yet. <laughs> as long as I come back to B. So if there is an improvisational quality to the dialogue, um, it's because I've worked so hard on building up the restrictions. That's, uh, that's really, really interesting. And of course, that makes a huge amount of sense also about my question beforehand about your, your, the way you seek out these very, very external structures because they're holding mechanisms that are productive of that freedom. But um, let, yeah. so let me ask about the planning thing that you, you plan things, yeah. you play out beforehand. Um, as with any playwright, the plan includes some information and it doesn't include other information. What is in your yeah. plan? Um, what I will have, oh man, it's, it, yeah, what I will have in it will be uh, in bold, there will be the number of the scene and the location of the scene. And then below that, there'll be the characters who are in the scene. And then below that, there'll be the objectives of which of the two characters. I always think of scenes as being, like um, uh, tennis matches or games of tennis between two characters or more characters. Uh, and in that sense, there's always a character who's serving in the tennis match. Mm. And I'll always decide, all right, this is their scene, they're serving, all right? So in Light Falls, um, go, it's in, it's, it's in Ash's bedroom, it's Christine and Ash, and uh, Christine is serving. And her job is to tell Ash 
that she must never try and hurt herself again. That's what she's got to get to. Um, what's stopping her is that, well, she's dead. <laughs> it's, one, it's one thing stopping her. But also is, it takes a certain amount of emotional bravery uh, to get to that frankness uh, because she needs to, and Ash is vulnerable, Ash is a vulnerable person and will be freaked out by the fact that her mother who has died um, or um, she doesn't know her mother's dead. Her mother's come to visit her when she, and she'll be surprised by her mother's sudden appearance. So Christine, who is serving, uh, has to negotiate all these obstacles and that was what will be in the plan. And there might be other things like from the notebook, if there's things in the notebook, which I think that's a really sexy image, that's a really sexy line, that's a really cool thing to say, <clears throat> that's a really funny joke, uh, that's a surprising thing. I might put those in the plan as well. Right. And so how long would this document be? About four pages, four or five right. pages. For, for, for a 90-page for a play, it'll be about four pages. Yeah. And, and um, uh, to pick another just very specific moment from that play that, again, kind of just just kind of startled me, delighted me, intrigued me, is, uh, and for people who don't know this play, I should just say it's, a, it's kind of fundamentally about three siblings, two sisters and a brother, uh, who are all in certain ways slightly vulnerable or damaged or broken or whatever it is. Um, and we see their stories separately, but they're all sort of, it's interleaved and interwoven. There's a moment where one of the characters starts roaring, roaring like a lion, and then the other sibling starts roaring in their scene, and a th the third sibling is roaring in their scene. Did you know they were going to start roaring before you wrote the scene, or was that something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I'm sure that's. Uh, oh, it's. Just... I think that might have been the kind of thing that comes from something like Terence Davis. I'm sure I have a memory and I've, I've not written it down. Um, I should have prepared properly and then I could have... I'm pretty sure... I'm pretty sure that I knew that before I started writing. I had the idea of the three of them in different spaces, in different cities, yeah. at different times. Uh, kind of like roaring in different ways as well, as though, as though calling to one another. Um, uh, I, I think I knew I had that before I started writing. Uh, and, and part of the planning of Light Falls was structuring. It was quite a mathematical, it was, quite like, it was kind of like a mathematical process of structuring all the different narratives so that they could plausibly roar within the context of their own given narrative. So the brother, uh, Stephen, roars because of his immense frustration in the situation. Um, Ash roars because of the horror of a request that is made to her by her, the father of her baby. Um, and Jess roars actually in kind of like sexual exhilaration. <laughs> they kind of, you know, they're very different, three different uh, different roars. I needed to make sure all at the same time and just kind of shuffle, shuffle the plays together. I think what happened was I, I, uh, I wrote all the scenes, all the stories um, completely discreetly. So I'd finished the whole kind of, uh, and then I shuffle them up. I think it's weird. I wrote it on a residency. Uh, so I was away from home, away from the family, away from England. I was in Melbourne on a residency in Melbourne. And I'm, I'm quite a social animal. I don't l like kind of complete isolation, completely being on my own. But I was in complete isolation, uh, living in this old, very spooky house. Mm. on the Yarra Valley in the suburb of Ivanhoe, getting up every morning and not having children to feed or dogs to walk, you know, just being living with me in my mind, <laughs> which is kind of weird. Uh, my memory of writing it was I did know, I did know that that, I, that wasn't a discovery in the writing. Mm. I wrote it quickly because I planned it carefully. I couldn't have made a discovery like that in the writing, I took, I took that plan to that residency and knew that I had two weeks to write a play. So I decided to do it in a week. <laughs> right. so, so that kind of contradicts the notion of total planning mm. um, because I think what I planned, yes, this is right. What I planned what was the discrete stories of the way they would be kind of scrabbled together, I think I discovered in Melbourne. 
I knew that I was going to do that, but I actually did it in Melbourne. Okay. And um, uh, that kind of takes us into rewriting, because obviously right. I, th I think it's a, a standard thing that, that playwrights, when they start off, find rewriting unbearable and incredibly difficult and so on because you kind of go isn't it good enough i got the thing finished now you're asking me to rewrite it but you know my experience is the more you go on the more yeah. exciting rewriting is but maybe yeah. you're different what, what's your experience of rewriting I mean, uh, unfortunately for you, I'm not different at all. My experience is exactly that. Right. Um, <clears throat> in the first, the first two plays, um, yeah, and uh, you know, our own psychologies are all very particular. But I wonder if there's something in an artist that um, maybe, maybe specifically a playwright, but I wonder if it's more general to artists that kind of thrives when praised or, th you know, writes to please in some way. And so the notion of a rewrite kind of almost wounds you in quite a deep psychological <laughs> level because all you really want, the only thing we really want as artists is the person to re who read our plays to go, there are no notes, this is the perfect play. You've actually... <laughs> You know, no, this is maybe the best play that any human's ever written. So well done. Now you can do it. <laughs> and, you know, to my total astonishment, that has never happened to me. And normally there's been some director or artistic director or literary manager who's got thoughts about how I can refine or clarify the thing. Uh, and the first few plays, I found that really wounded. Like, kind of, like, you know, quite upsetting. Um, and then now, um, you know, I still need a little bit of flattery. I still need a little bit, you know, I still, it's really funny. I mean, you must get sent a lot of plays, not only by your students, but your friends and your peers. And, you know, somebody's working on a play and because you're such a brilliant reader, they'll send it to you for, their, for your thoughts. And I bet even like the most experienced playwrights you work with will send it with the caveat, you can tell me if you think it's shit. <laughs> oh. like, every yeah. single play anybody's ever sent me they said <laughs> right and it's really funny yeah because there is no way I've, I've been talking to writers for 20 years yeah i've never told them that their play is shit because it's not it, a, a i don't think it has been and b um it wouldn't be helpful <laughs> to, to anybody <laughs> to anybody but it's something that question tell me if you think it's shit is so indicative of our vulnerability and our fragility and that psychological need to please somebody i still do it now when i send a play off now there's always part of me it's just like please love me <laughs> um <laughs> uh, so you get so that's still there i'm not saying you grow out of that i definitely haven't grown out of that um but um but what 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 i would say is um uh I'm now more aware that the next bit where you unpack the thing and you clarify it is actually the sexiest bit of playwriting. I think it's the most fun. And it's the most fun. But if I can get over the emotional bruises, then it's actually, that's really, really great to, did, to excavate and pick it apart. For me, I did, I, did, I did one thing once which kind of broke that reluctance to do, uh, to do rewriting. Uh, and I've always been able to rewrite since then, which was, I kind of realized that when somebody said rewrite, I would open up the original draft and just kind of go through it tinkering and sort of, yeah. you know, I'd be, I'd go into it with a kind of, I need to sort this scene out. And then I'd be going, oh, but that's really, I love that bit. And, and so on. And I, yeah. so, so I yeah. did this thing where I printed it up and I deleted it from my computer. And so I had, Whoa! So, yeah, so if there was going to be a second draft, I was going to have to type it again. And it was, it was an insane thing to do, but it, it worked brilliantly because actually no line of dialogue is so good that you'll type it up again just for the hell of it. You know, it had to really earn its place. And I was swear, of course, I was swearing at past me the whole way through, but it was a really great way of forcing a second draft. So, do you do that with every play now? No, absolutely not. I did it that one time, 
it just right. taught me how to 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 learn to love sec, uh, a second draft. Yeah. yeah, I think McDowell does that, right? I think McDowell. Uh, my understanding of his in the last few plays, he's written them by hand, and that when he rewrites them, he rewrites them them from the beginning without without looking at the first draft. <laughs> just, I, you know, it's just like, come on. <laughs> there is there is Microsoft Word, actually. <laughs> you, can, you can use it. You can use a computer. Um, um, so, uh, it, no, I, what, well, yeah. what, what I find with redrafting, what, what um, my approach is much more inspired by conversations with the, the, the great Stephen Jeffries, who kind of taught me to redraft, really. Um, he, he was, for him, it's very important that you print the play off. And I think that's a really important stage. <clears throat> if there's anybody watching this who is a playwright, I think don't do, a re don't do, a, um, don't do an initial reading of a play uh, on the screen. Because what you'll do is you'll end up being drawn into the text too closely. And you'll change a comma to a full stop and think that you're doing a rewrite. Yeah. So print the play off so you're working from a hard copy. And also leave it, leave it for as long as you can. If you're able to leave it for a month, it's brilliant, but certainly leave it for two weeks if you can. And then read it in one go. You know, don't, don't, don't read it in bits, read it in one go and take the hit of the whole play. Uh, and then you need to distinguish between what you want the play to do and what the play actually does to you. And then you can just, as, and then read it a second time and just, Mark, the first time you read it, you shouldn't have a pen in your hand. You should just read it straight. The second time you can have a pen in your hand and just mark the text of areas that you, that in retrospect you remember were unclear or unsatisfactory, didn't do the job you wanted them to do, and just kind of mark them through. And then I get like a list of jobs that I want to do on a draft. And sometimes that will be helped by conversations with other people. So the director will say, you need to look at that and that and that. And then rather than going through the play from page one to page 90 or whatever, and doing all the jobs at once, I'll go through and say, right, in today's redraft, I'm going to look at that. And that will be the job of the day is just redrafting that. And then the next day, I'll just redraft another element. Um, because it means that you're more detached and you're working more with craft and with rigour rather than falling in love with lines of dialogue. That's the thing you've got to avoid. You've got to avoid falling back in love with lines of dialogue. Yeah. And actually, well, the other thing which I've started doing now, <clears throat> like one of my favourite bits of the play, it's really good on word, it's good on, it's good on pen and paper as well, when you kind of like really carefully sculpt around the text that you're going to cut, like a surgeon taking... <laughs> taking a tumor out you do really care i really love doing that and, and then pressing delete or actually i never press delete what i do i've done this for every play for 20 years is i have a a, a file in the folder called outtakes uh, and i'll take the text out and i'll put it in the outtakes folder uh, outtakes file which i never ever ever look at ever again <laughs> but it makes me think as though i've not wasted anything it's the opposite to your approach in that sense <laughs> You should just one day. You should just publish all the outtakes without explanation <laughs> in a single book. <laughs> it's so shit. It'd be so <laughs> terrible. There's a reason they didn't make it in the play. I should look at them though. It'd be interesting to see. It'd be interesting to see. I bet there's things. I bet there's things which I've taken out of all of the plays. There'll be like some impulse that I want to kind of write about something. And I've never got it right. I bet. I bet you look at the outtakes of Herons and Motown, pornography and common disruption and light falls would be one line or one image that I'm, I keep trying to squeeze into a play. That might not be a bad idea. I could do it in lockdown. Um, <laughs> quick question. Uh, yeah. What font is your font of choice for writing plays? Yeah, it's really, it's really, it's really, I'm, I always feel like an old man when I say uh, I'd still like Times New Roman. Times New Roman. Okay, that's good. Times I had this conversation Roman. with James Graham because he likes Baskerville. Uh, but oh I, yeah, I think he said that like. it's what it is. What Methuen actually published their plays in. So, is it? so is I think it? he's oh, like pre-formatting it <laughs> for them, which is oh that's good. Yeah. See, I'm I'm I'm, I'm in I'm in Korea, 
which is i know it's a bit weird but it's partly because it means that it's very provisional it doesn't look nice and it means i can scribble all over them and stuff like that i think that's the reason right. oh, anyway. so you've been uh, this is a question i'm asking everybody it's a really blunt question you but you've been writing for you know you've been writing professionally for over 20 years what have you learned about playwriting what can you do now that 20 years ago you didn't know how to do but now you go yeah i think i know how to do this that's a fun question it's frustrating because i probably because we touched on it or talked about it but i'd probably say redrafting would be one thing Mm. And maybe, or maybe it's a particular element of redrafting, which I feel more confident about in the last two or three years, is if somebody tells me that, or I realise that there needs to be a scene which is completely reconceived, or, you know, um, I'm just doing rewrites on The Shining at the moment, and just in conversation with Evo, and he kind of had a suggestion for a scene. And there was a time where I'd be like, oh, well, I've got to write a whole, I've got to go through the, the hell of making a whole scene again. And now I feel much more like, okay, yeah, I can do that. And then I know I can do it in a day. I know I can, I can probably write a scene in a day or an afternoon. I can probably get a scene done in an afternoon. And I feel, I feel less frightened by that radical idea. <clears throat> um, I think. And um, so I I want to just ask you, I know we've talked a bit about Light Falls already, but I want to just ask a couple of specific questions. Um, I wondered what the relationship was, if any, in your head between this and Shore of the Wide World and Blindsided, which to me they sort of feel, I mean, they're Sarah Frankham, they're Royal Exchange plays but is is there more continuity because it seems like it's a very distinct thread of work in your in your much bigger body of work yeah and port as well i would put port in that trajectory and weirdly i wouldn't necessarily put punk rock rock, no i wouldn't although punk rock was directed by sarah franklin and was originally commissioned by and produced at the royal exchange Mm. um I think the other is what the other the other kind of collaborator that's been in both Blindsided and Light Falls and other plays is Katie Katie West, um, the, the the actor Katie West, who played Ash uh, at the Royal Exchange in, in Light Falls and uh, played Kathy in Blindsided. And I think what Sarah and Katie and the Royal Exchange share that kind of provokes that particular resonant vibration or re- causes me to vibrate at that resonant frequency. There's a northernness. There's the fact that, uh, that in some sense, they're considerations of Stockport. So they're considerations of home. So it, it, uh, it inspires me to have a very particular relationship with nostalgia that I'm necessarily looking back to where I've come from. Um, I like the, uh, you know, like Don Draper in that scene from Mad Men, <clears throat> you know, the notion that nostalgia is, is a deliberate opening up of old wounds. Um, there's something in that process of writing plays for Sarah and for Katie and for that theatre in the round in that city that inspires me to look at particular wounds in a particular way. And the, the wounds formed in Stockport, uh, and they might be there for, um, uh, I mean, all of the plays, alcohol is present, is present. But in those plays, particularly, I think, uh, a yearning for the horizon, a yearning for the, possi- the, the possibility of seeing hills beyond the motorway, yeah, um, uh, that physical landscape, which has some kind of emotional metaphor, which infects the dialogue in some way, I think. Um, I think there are plays in which people are more likely to ride on buses than on tube trains, <laughs> and certainly more likely to ride on buses than in planes, 
You know, they're not, they're, they're, I've written lots of plays in which characters will, you know, there's a line in Motortown, I'm more used to, I'm more used to Paul, the gun engineer. <clears throat> there's something, that Motortown was a real hinge in my kind of working life in that sense. There's something about the, the scene in Motortown where Danny takes his gun to Paul, the gun engineer, and he has a line which says, I'm more used to flying on planes than riding on buses. And I think there's something, there's part of that is Stephen's making sense of his own mess. <laughs> Um, and Stevens looking back at Stockport Stevens and kind of thinking that was the truth or there was something that was where that um, you know there's a line in punk rock you can't deny where you're from you are where you're from mm. you just keep pretending you're not um, is the line in, in punk rock uh, and, and I think there's a lot I think those plays force me to look at my, where I've come from with a very particular kind of like frankness and nostalgic tone kind of like the view of reconciliation or reckoning maybe their plays of reckoning in that way i don't know yeah and, and one of the things i think is so i should have said by the way uh i didn't know i hadn't read like falls until this weekend <laughs> and uh my god it's a beautiful play oh god oh. lovely <laughs> You know how happy I told you how happy that makes me. Now I've declared. <laughs> I should have said that. To start with one of the things I thought was really lovely is also there is this. Um, I mean, it feels very organic. It feels very delicate, even though it feels like actually it's a very robust play, of course. But there's that delicacy to it. There's I, I love. There's a sort of there's a kind of basket of these images uh, that are never. To, as far as I can figure out, never quite explained, but like locked churches and nosebleeds mm. and sudden rainstorms <laughs> that feel very yeah. intuitively like they're all part of the same kind of moral universe of some kind. Right. Though I don't know what they mean and what their significance is particularly, but and I don't particularly want to know. How how did they kind of emerge? Those sorts of the, that kind of landscape of the of the of the play. How did that emerge? Those specific ones. I mean, a lot of them came from the road trips. You know, the real. I mean, just really, like, really, really boring, simple thing like being with Sarah in Ulverston, or uh, Sarah didn't come to Ulverston. Being Sarah in Blackpool, being with Sarah in Blackpool, and going from the prom back to, uh, into into the back of the town. You see a beautiful church, you can't get in, it's locked. <laughs> you know, being, being in, in Durham and going to the cathedral, uh, and we were able to go in, but we had to leave because they were about to lock it up. Um, and there was something about the metaphor of a locked church that seemed incredibly, <laughs> incredibly resonant, you know. Uh, and partly is, a, partly is like, in economic terms, it is a consequence of austerity because the Church of England or, you know, the different churches are much more skint than they were. They can't always be manned. They can't always be somebody there to open the church and, 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 and look after it. And especially, you know, the more broken neighbourhood is, the likelihood is that they'll be sharing, sharing a vicar with four or five other towns. Yeah. So more likely to get a locked church. It's a symbol of poverty, but it's also, a, you know, my son, my eldest son, is always telling me um, that, you know, he, he kind of says, you know, you are such a Christian, Dad. You're like an atheist Christian. <laughs> and and the, the the old the older I the older I get, and the more you know, if I think about the most recent plays, Maria, which you read. Uh, which is, is another one that's not been it's not been published in England and not been produced in England. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's a story of a, a virgin birth, kind of at Easter. There's this kind of fascination with the iconography of of the Christian narrative. And I, as somebody, I don't believe in kind of I don't have any faith. I don't happen to have any faith. So the the lock church on one hand, it was an accident. We kept coming across all these beautiful churches that were locked. On the other hand, it was a political metaphor. And on the other hand, on some unconscious level, it was me making sense of the mess of my mind. And nosebleeds, literally, when I was writing it in Melbourne, I kept having nosebleeds. <laughs> and and, I'm, and I've, not, I've not had nosebleeds since I was a small child. And I was absolutely convinced they were indicative of uh, imminent brain hemorrhage. <laughs> You know, I just thought, oh, fuck, I am going to die here, away from my family, alone in this weird, spooky house 
in the suburbs of Melbourne. To the point where I went to the doctor about it, I was so frightened. I went to an Australian doctor. And <laughs> look on his face, he said, well, what, what you've had is called a nosebleed. <laughs> But there was something, what was, what was, what, like, why did they make it into a fucking play? Because I also, like, there would have, you know, I would have had sandwiches and gone to the toilet, and they're not in the play. There's something about the nosebleed that's in the play. It's the uh, imminence of emergency, I guess. Mm. It's the viscerality of it. Um, it's the reminder that these are people who live in bodies. Yeah. You know, you know um, so much of our kind of life, this is what's so startling or, or, or interesting about this time about the time of the lockdown and the people who have been fortunate enough to not be affected directly by it or not be poorly or, you know, quite a lot of the conversation has been about how this is a reminder of something bef from before capitalism almost, you know, it's a reminder of what, what, imp what is important in life, yeah. you know, the importance of family and the importance of stillness and the importance of thought. It's the antithesis to my kind of like life up to it, but um, there's something about a nosebleed it's just it's like, hey, you're not immortal. You're in a body. There's blood coursing through you. Hmm. You're 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 both you're both uh, you're both mortal and you're very much alive. And there's something about that. And the weird comedy of just having a nosebleed is really funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, last question. Uh, Jarvis Cocker wrote yeah. the song in this. Yeah. How, yeah. how did that come about? What was that like? Did you work with him or did he just go and write the song himself? It was glorious. Um, I, I uh, knew I wanted a song in it. I, I knew I wanted a hymn in it. Like specific, and, and something that, I, you know, um, <clears throat> something that is lacking from... Uh, well, something that's lacking for, absolutely from everybody's life at the moment is congregation, right? You know, we're not allowed to congregate. And in its absence, we maybe realise how beautiful it is. You know, the, the nature of theatre is it's built on congregation. I think the reason why <clears throat> it's the art form that's more important to me than, say, than cinema or television is because the nature of that congregation, you know, you're bringing strangers together in the same place at the same time. And there is something that is kind of, uh, it's almost like a, um, a secular church, the theatre for me. It's kind of a place where you gather with people, you sit together for a while, you're looking in the same direction um, and, and experiencing something at the same time as people you don't necessarily know. Um, and I wanted, uh, and so I was, and the hymn is the musical form of congregation. And I really like the, and I only ever sing hymns at christenings and funerals. And most of my friends, don't have their children christened anymore. So fundamentally only sing hymns at funerals. But there's often a moment when I read, you know, and I'm not a good singer, and probably most people aren't great singers, but the notion of singing together is really beautiful, and I was drawn to that. I think a friend of a friend knew Jarvis Cocker's manager, uh, and I just wrote the manager an email and said, I'm this playwright these are some of my plays. I'm writing a play. I want to put a song in it. I want to write a hymn for the North of England. Uh, I, I think there's only one songwriter in England who can do it. Um, uh, would you be interested? In, and, and to my astonishment, uh, he wrote back. And, uh, and so we met and we had coffee together and we talked about the idea and he said, uh, and, then, and then I said, well, I'm going to go on my, he was quite taken by the idea of me going to Doncaster as part of my research trip because <laughs> uh, that's very much his part of the world um, uh, and we got, we got on very well and, uh, uh, and he said well you just go and write the play and when you're ready for him send it to me and if, if I think there's something in it then I'll do it yeah um, and so I wrote the first draft and I sent it to him and he replied very quickly and said, yeah, you, you really did. I love this. Let, let me have a go. Uh, and we met and talked and met and talked with Sarah as well. Uh, and she talked about her, about what, why hymns were important to her and the history of hymn writing in the North of England, the history of vicars who would write hymns that would be sung in their congregation, uh, in particular in places like, um, 
you know, Doncaster's got a really ancient church right in the heart of the city. Um, you know, there's been congregations in that place for hundreds of years, and it will be the vicars who will have written the songs. Uh, and there's something really lovely about that. It's really beautiful. Um, and I also talked about my love of country music and how, um, you know, country music, normally that song structure will come from hymns. And so we largely major key. You know, there's nothing too melodically complicated about it. It should be simple. It's for a hundred people to sing together who aren't singers. So you can't do anything too elaborate. Uh, and, um, and he went away and didn't do anything until kind of two days before the deadline. And me and Sarah were just like, shit, what are we going to do? Um, maybe we could get a theatre composer to write something. And then two days before he wrote me an email and said, I've done it. <laughs> and I, I think it was just beautiful. It was just, it was perfect. And um, he, uh, he, it was, it was the most gorgeous song. Uh, and he captured the spirit of the play really brilliantly. <clears throat> he'd drawn it from images in the play. You know, he'd read the play very carefully and kind of like just very delicately taken images and, um, you know, what the hot line is don't forget your northern blood. <laughs> and, so, and, and he talked about the nosebleeds. And also the other thing which is beautiful, it was also, it was a song, he said it was a song for his son, who, who's 17 years old and lives in Paris. Um, and, you know, the, the lyric goes something, I'll be watching, I'll be watching from the shoreline. I'll be, you know, wishing you goodbye. Uh, but it's basically saying, just don't forget, don't forget where you come from, don't forget the northern soul, don't forget your northern blood. <laughs> Please stay in sight of the mainland. <laughs> uh, and uh, and it, was, it was gorgeous, it was a gorgeous song. Um, he um, came to the first read through. <laughs> and everybody was like, I fucking Jarvis Cocker. But the thing about him, you know, I met and I've met a handful of people who are famous in the music industry. But of all of them, he's maybe the most like the kind of people I would drink with in pubs in Stockport. Right. He's very, very recognizable and down to earth and normal. Uh and 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 then when he came to see a pre he came to see a preview and reorchestrate. he kind of see the Saturday preview and reorchestrated it on Sunday, but re very simply and very, in a row, it was very practical and manageable, but just made it better. Uh, wow. It was great. It was great. And a wonderful reminder of a time when we used to congregate and hopefully will congregate again soon. But look, Simon, so. thank you so much for your time. That was fascinating as always. And I look forward to seeing you once all this is over. See you on the other side, mate. The other side. <laughs> Stay safe. Stay yeah. safe. And you. Lots of love. Cheers. All right. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Not at all. Oh, my dog's coming in now. <coughs> oh, no, it's not. Hello, I'm just, I'm doing an interview. I was going to say that I'm done with me. You've done your workout? Okay, you're going to get some clothes on? No. <coughs> <coughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Tell Ma. Lockdown. <laughs>